it's the road for us. All right, so we've learned a lot about soils data today. We've we have a ton of data out there, um, but really data in itself is useless unless you're applying it. And in the conservation planning process is re really where we're going to apply that information and, and use it. And, and that's what uh, what makes that data useful. We have some objectives here. Uh, the main part of what I'm going to talk about is, is that second objective where we're really going to um, go through some diverse examples of how soils uh, are affect the conservation planning process. I'm going to talk about some agronomic, biological, and engineering practices, maybe throw a little forestry in there. And then Adam's going to talk about grazing examples. Um, you know, many of those, many of these that I'm going to talk about anyway are ones that we've already heard about today. But these are really the important ones and we want to drive these home that uh, that these are the ones that we're going to be using a lot and, and I want to go into a little bit more detail of, of when we use them throughout the planning process. This is going to be far from an all inclusive list. Um, it's, it would just take us forever to go through every single one of these examples, but we just want to really show how some of these are used. Um, the other part to remember and I'm really glad Andy talked uh, uh, at length about this is that you know, we want to use these these properties and interpretations, but we have to ground truth them. You have to learn about your soils. You have to learn about where they belong on your landscape and what they look like. Uh, use these interpretations, but go out in the field and make sure that everything's making sense out there. All right, here is our conservation planning process. Uh, it is a three phase, nine step conservation planning process. It is the core of what we do as an agency and as partner agencies as, as conservation planners. Uh, we start out in phase one where we're doing collection and analysis. That's where we identify problems, determine objectives, inventory resources, analyze our resource data. That's really where we're doing data collection there. Then we go to phase two where we formulate alternatives, evaluate those alternatives, we present that to our client and the client makes decisions. Once they make the decisions on what practices and, and they're going to implement, uh, we go to phase three. That's the application and evaluation phase where we implement that plan and then evaluate the plan. So uh, let's start out we're going to kind of go through how soils data is used through each of the different phases and we're going to start out obviously in phase one. Um, phase one to me is all about collecting data. We're collecting data about our clients, their objectives, and we're also collecting data about our, our planning unit. Um, obviously we collect a soils map and map descriptions so we know what we're working with. But we'd also, we should also be gathering some additional information early in the planning process and, and using our tools uh, to give us more information so we, we know what we're looking at earlier in the process. One of these, um, when we're looking at gathering data on our planning unit, there aren't many reports that give us more information than the conservation planning report. Uh, this report is, is mainly uh, helpful to us as we're planning in cropland. Uh, let me bring up a thing here. So this will be in one of those reports that, that Andy talked about. Uh, so it's in that soils report tab. It's down here under soil erosion and it's the conservation planning report. So he, here is just a, a screenshot of, of a couple different soils for this conservation planning report. Um, and you can just see that it gives us just a ton of information that we'll use when we go and do our field visit. Um, and then as we get into using our tools to like measure soil loss, um, a lot of this phase one work uh, is, is going to uh, have some great information here. So what kind of things are, are useful that we see on here? Well, we have our T factor and our K factor, uh, which are, are great when we're looking at, uh, at figuring out our dominant critical slope, when we're measuring sheet and, and real erosion. We have our wind erodibility index, uh, that we can use to uh, see if wind erosion is a concern for us. If that index is high enough, we, we know that we have enough risk there for some wind erosion that we need to run our tools to, to measure that. We have some, some example or kind of some average slopes and slope percentages that are kind of helpful just to, that's, that's one of those helpful parts of, of when we're ground truthing those soils, uh, you know. If we're looking for at this Casco soil here and it should be somewhere around a nine for 150 um, and we get out there and it's and it's flat, um, you know, maybe we're, we're not standing on a Casco soil. Um, we also have our 
our uh, surface particle size over here too. This should give us an idea of going back to that textural triangle of, uh, of what surface texture we should be we should be working with. So great information here, really good stuff to know early on in the planning process. Um, so in phase one is also where we should begin to consider our NEPA requirements. So the, the National Environmental Policy Act is um, is an act that uh, was it really it brings together all of the federal laws that may apply to our planning process. So and several of these tie directly back to soils. Um, in our assessment, uh, in our assessment to see if we are affecting wetlands with our planning process, we need to know if wetlands are present in the planning area. So this over here is is right from our our guide sheet for for wetlands. Uh, the first question it asks, are wetlands present in or near our planning area? Well, how do we know that? We know there are, there are three, three requirements to, to have a wetland, three things that we need to have to, to have a wetland, hydrogen soils, wetland hydrology, and hydrophytic vegetation. So pulling this, uh, the hydric soils report is a good way for us to start documenting if wetlands are, are present in our, in our planning unit. And once we know if they're if they're there or not, that's the first step of seeing if we're going to affect them with our planning process. Uh, I, I know uh, prime and unique farmland was uh, was already brought up. Um, is the Prime and Unique Farmland Act, I believe, is the name of that. So um, this is another one of our special environmental concerns. And and same thing. This is a, a snip from our guide sheet for that. This says our prime and unique farmlands or farmlands of of statewide or local importance present in our area. Well, how do we know that? We need to pull that prime and unique farmland report to to see if we have them. Then if we have them, that's where where we talk about that next step of of if uh, I think I can bring it to that as we go here. So here in the this is in the suitabilities and limitations rating tab under land classification is farmland classification. And here's another snip of uh, that report. So here I have um, my planning unit here has prime farmland on it. And so I'll just, I'll need to keep that in mind as I get later into the process to ensure that we don't recommend alternatives that would change that land use to a non egg related use. Again, this, that's rare that, that we would recommend something like that, but it is something that we do need to keep in mind as, as we're going through the planning process. So in phase one, uh, one of the main tasks that we have would be complete in phase one is identifying what resource concerns are present in our planning unit. So once we have that list, we're going to go into phase two and we need to develop alternatives to treat those resources. So we do that by identifying conservation practices that are feasible to be installed on the ground. So when we develop alternatives, uh, we need to manage risk in a way that we are recommending practices that are likely to be successful on the site and we'll treat those resource concerns for the expected lifespan of the practice. So that's how we can justify spending taxpayer dollars on a project and that's what I mean by feasible to be installed. Not just uh, can we build it here, but can we build it in a way that will be successful to treat that resource concern and last for the lifespan of the practice? And we use a ton of soils data to 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 figure that out. So an example here, an engineering example. Let's pretend we are working with a producer that has a manure resource concern. And uh, as we're developing our alternative, we're considering uh, adding a, a concrete manure storage structure to our alternative. One of the many things that we need to, to check to ensure that a concrete pit is feasible to be installed on the site is to check the risk of soil corrosion to the concrete walls and floors of the pit. So here in, in suitabilities and limitations uh, in building site development, we have a corrosion to concrete rating. So we're gonna take a look at that. So the risk of, of corrosion is the potential soil induced electrochemical and chemical action that weakens the concrete. If the risk of corrosion is high, the soil may corrode and damage the structure and not allow it to function for the lifespan of the practice. If that's the case, maybe a concrete pit is not the best option to put in my alternative, at least in that site. 
we can maybe move it to a soil that has a, a lower rating or maybe we need to look at, at doing something else here on my on my cascos and foxes and hawkeyes here i only have some some moderate and, and low ratings For our, our phase two forestry example, where we're developing our alternative for a forestry uh, land use planning area, um, we're considering completing a harvest as part of our alternative uh, to a site that doesn't have access to it. So we're considering adding a, a forest trail and landing as a supporting practice to our, uh, to our alternative system to allow for the harvest to be successful. How can we tell? Well, if a trail or a landing is feasible to be installed successfully, well, we have an interpretation for that. In suitabilities and limitation rating, under land management, we have construction limitations for haul roads and log landings. So if possible, we should try to site our trails and landings in areas with lower risk. We can usually design anything to make it work, uh, but typically, when we're designing practices to be installed in areas with higher risk of failure, we need to add in some mitigating, some risk mitigating factors uh, or features. So that also adds cost to the project. In other words, poor ratings don't necessarily mean that a practice is not possible, but it is likely to be more expensive. So when possible, we should try and keep the practices located in areas of lower risk. So here um, I have some some moderate risk due to slope on on but on my cascos here. Oh, no, I'm sorry, on my hawkeyes. So we could um, if we left that unaddressed and if we just um, put in a, a a forestry road there, um, it would it would likely have some erosion issues from water running down the road. So we would have if we have no choice but to site it in these areas, um, we would need to put in some some mitigating factors like these water bars that you could maybe see in the picture here. It's starting to get overgrown. There's a little um, uh, dirt hump in the road here to divert water off of it to a safer area to, to run. This obviously this took longer, more time and more materials to build. So it's more expensive to build that here. If we could have sited that somewhere else in our greener areas or in areas with lesser slope, um, we wouldn't have had to install those. For our phase two example for cropland, let's pretend we are considering adding a prairie strip to our alternative. Uh, if we recommend that the producer installs the, the prairie strips in a highly productive area of the field, we might lose credibility with them. So it's always something that we should consider if we're um, going to add anything to our alternative that's going to take land out of crop production. We should make sure we're setting that in areas of, of that, that makes sense for their operation. We wouldn't want to, if we have flexibility in that siting, we wouldn't want to site that in areas of, that, that are high yielding, high rate of return for the client. One option to help us look at, uh, at the uh, potential productivity and the potential, potential yield is, the, is this corn productivity index that, that Andy mentioned. So in soils reports, vegetative productivity, uh, commodity crop production index for corn. So here we can see this report. Um, and, and, and like was mentioned, we do get two different options here. We have the national corn and soybean index, and we also have the Wisconsin corn index. Uh, the, the ratings are what I look at. So we have moderately low, moderately low, um, you know, and this is this is kind of where where Andy was saying that there are potentially some issues. I tend to stick with with the national, um, but but if you are confident and, and comfortable with what you see out of Wisconsin, feel free to use that. This is something that we will also uh, work on improving. So um, you can see if I'm trying to site my prairie strip here, I do have um, a lot of areas in my field that are that are high inherent productivity, but here on some of my Casco, uh, it has moderately low inherent productivity. Maybe this is where I'm looking to to site that prairie strip if it if it makes sense in the field. Okay, now we're moving on to phase three. So um, 
a very large part, uh, or our part anyway, of phase three is designing the practices in our alternative uh, that the client has selected to install. So we provide designs, we provide job sheets, we provide site-specific information that uh, lets the client know how we expect these practices to be installed so that they can be successful. Obviously, uh, soils that we're working with are very important to this process uh, for many, if not all of our practices. One of the most widely used interpretations uh, for design engineering practices is the hydrologic soil group. And, and so this is, again, been mentioned before, but this is the, the runoff potential for a soil. We're in properties and, and qualities ratings, soil qualities and features, hydrologic soil group. So this is already mentioned, but, it, but hydrologic, soil, hydrologic soil group is an interpretation of the infiltration rate of a soil. And since runoff and infiltration are, are inverse of each other, the less water that's going to infiltrate into that soil, uh, the more water that's going to run off. But as Andy said, we don't, we don't use this for things like manure runoff or pesticide runoff, that kind of stuff, but we use it a lot for our engineering practices. A has the highest infiltration, so the lowest runoff, and D has the least infiltration, so the most runoff. And, uh, and we already talked about those dual hydrologic groups. Now, where we, where we continue to use that, um, so this is a table from the Engineering Field Handbook, Chapter 2, EFH2 uh, for short, and the hydrologic soil group together with the management determine the runoff curve number. And, and, and that's what we really use when we're designing a lot of erosion control practices. Uh, when designing something like a grass waterway, we need to know the amount of water that's expected to run off from a given watershed. So, um, uh, so since we the, the runoff curve number is kind of that inherent infiltration to, to runoff rate for that soil, but it is definitely um, also affected by management. The, 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 the rougher a soil is, the, the more infiltration that you'll have or the slower that the runoff is going to be anyway. So, so that's why it's a multi-step process to get this runoff curve number. It's not just based off this, the hydrologic soil group. Um, for our cropland example, let's say we are looking at designing a prairie planting. Uh, we've got many options for, for plants that, to include in our planting, uh, but we do want to match our plants with our soil conditions. This is part of, of, of us saying that this is feasible to be installed here, or that this is going to be successful. We need to, we need to select the plants that are going to do well on our site. Uh, soil moisture is a major player in which plants will be most successful on that site. You can see that in our tech note down here, oh boy, down here, uh, each species has a recommended moisture regime. Uh, and that's what we we're talking about right before I got started here. Uh, this, this follows through then on our seed calculator that we use to design our mixes. This is a, from our Excel spreadsheet. We select our, our moisture regime that we're working in uh, to help us select the species. Uh, so here's a little bit more of the background of, of how these were returned were uh, determined. Um, you can see that it's it's based off of the available water capacity. And if you remember back to your soils class, the available water capacity is the field capacity. So um, so it's field capacity is one step down from saturation. It's how much uh, all after everything is saturated, after all those macropores infiltrate out, uh, that water that's that that soil can hold is the field capacity, minus the permanent wilting point. So uh, it's it's the amount of plant available water that that soil can hold. Uh, that permanent wilting point is where those plants can't take any more water out of that soil. So from field capacity to permanent wilting point. Um, so where can we find these ratings? Because like we just discussed before we got started, this is not in Web Soil Survey. This can be found on uh, on Soil Data Mart. So Soil Data Mart used to be a, a national tool that that we used for for accessing soils data that that went away, um, but now we we do have that as an in-state tool. So here on the um, NRCS Wisconsin site, I went to Topics in Soils to get to our main Soils page, and then down here is uh, Soil Data Mart. 
let's click on that. We have some some reports and uh, down here at the bottom of my screen is the Wisconsin Soil Moisture Regime Site Assessment Guide. And once we click on that, uh, we have to we can we can only pull the data countywide information. So so here I have Fond du Lac County. This lists all of my soils in Fond du Lac County. And then if it's a little bit too small, you can see over here on the right are my soil moisture site conditions. So we can't get this down just to an area of interest. We can only do this countywide. So you could you can do this and print it out at least um, then you'll have it and you can uh, you can access that. So our phase three example for forestry, um, let's say we are designing a tree planting plan and uh, we're trying to select species that are suitable to be to be planted in our site, kind of similar to our prairie example. Same thing, moisture is 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 a very important uh, to tree selection. Um, so so drainage class is a big factor when we're selecting our tree species. Here we're in the properties and, and quantities ratings tab, soil qualities and features, drainage class. So here on my, on my um, uh, planning unit that I'm working on here, I have uh, mostly well-drained soils with some, some poorly drained soils. And uh, so, uh, so now from our field office technical guide, we have uh, appendix, appendices to our forestry tech note one. And we have appendices for, or an appendix for each county. And so these are all of the species that are, are native and available to be planted as, as part of our planning um, for each county. And you can see right here on the left is, is the drainage class listed for each of those species. Um, and then we've got the you know what what the letters mean down here so even though we consider soils differently throughout all three phases of the planning process i i, I hope you have a, a good appreciation for how important these the soils data is to our planning process and how important of a tool we have in in our soils tools especially in web soil survey so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Adam to talk about grazing planning. Hey everyone, how you doing? Can you hear me? Yep, you're good. Good to go. Josh, I'll just let you know in advance. Um, first of all, I want to let everyone know that everything that we talked about is something that I use every single time I'm looking at a plan. And the really cool thing about understanding how to use surveys and interpret them is you can really mesh those together and really get a good idea of what's going on on a site before you even step out there. And before I even jump into my conversation on rotational grazing and how I use these maps, one thing I want to get across to everybody is I think that if we all took the time even just to jump out to web soil survey or whatever tool you like ArcMap or would whichever soil data you're bringing that into. If you do the time, if you can pull all these base maps together and resource or uh, take a look at these sites ahead of time, you're gonna be able to quickly identify pretty accurately the areas uh, on those sites that are gonna need to be looked at, that have steep slopes, that potentially have erosion, that are wetlands. Like you're gonna be able to eliminate most of the walking that you're gonna have to do. I'm not saying you shouldn't walk the whole site, whether it's for grazing or waterways or cover crops or nutrient management, whatever you're doing. But by being able to do this ahead of time, you can really focus your time then on the more important sites and really adapt your plan to manage for that. So for rotational grazing, when Andy had asked me to uh, talk about this, the, one, the first thought that went through my mind are what are the most important maps that I'm looking at? What are the things that I find important? And when I show you these today, I don't want you to think these are the only ones I'm looking at, but when I've kind of filtered through the past 15 years of grazing planning, these have been the most critical ones to look at. So at the very least, if you only look at these, you've got a really good start. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to encourage you to actually jump out and take a broader look at some of the other stuff out there as well. But if you start with these for grazing, you're gonna have a really good point of starting. Now, the thing with grazing that I wanna stress is, you know, there isn't a single grazing operation that's marginally managed, like a decent run grazing operation looks really great from May to October every single year, even if we got a lot of rain, you know, it's still a pretty good looking operation. So we really got to consider those sensitive times of year when we get six inches of rain, like we just had, um, 
April, May, if you're beef operation, you're going to be outside winter time management. Those are going to be the really important things to consider with rotational grazing. And you want to think about that from the beginning of your plan and not the end of your plan. And that's how I like to use these maps to start building my grazing layout, my grazing plan, incorporating the soils, really isolating the different soils into different groups because that allows a producer to manage those uh, soils differently. And for instance, and we'll talk about this more when I get into this, while we jump ahead, Josh, I'm going to talk about it right now, actually. I'm going to start with Web Soil Survey. This is the first place I go to typically. Next slide, please. What I'd like to say is with the different soils and by being able to isolate different soils, you can really start to pull out those unique features and understanding where they lay on the landscape is important. Now, as everyone said before, these soils maps, there's errors in them, but in general, it's a really good starting point. Now, with all that being said, if I've got all these different sports suitability groups and sports suitability classes, which we'll talk about more with different grazing trainings that we've got, um, what they are different groupings of soil that respond the same way um, or plants respond the same way on them. So I can isolate plants into those groups. Uh, one, two, and three are very similar. Four, five, and six are very similar. And seven, eight, and nine are similar and tens a wetland. So if we can put four, five, and six groups together in the same pasture unit, I can seed that thing down to the same site or same species and you're going to have a very uniform grazing. You'll be able to put similar species out there and expect similar types of growth patterns on there. Now, if you were to put like a one and a nine together, very different types of soils, what's going to happen is, first of all, you're gonna have a different mix of grasses. They're probably gonna grow at different rates and the cows are gonna graze them very ununiformly. So from a conservation perspective, it may or may not be a problem, but from a landowner perspective, from a grazing perspective and a production perspective, what you've done is actually cost the producer money, cost the producer dry matter, and you've made this grazing plan potentially not as good as it could have been if you would have started off from the beginning and considered how important those different characteristics of those soils actually are. So when I look at these, and I'm going to go through these this list here real quick, the first one I chose was forage suitability, and I also, I'm sorry, I'm pointing at it. Josh, you just want to point at the, there you go. I've got the legend where it's found in Web Soil Survey, so you can go through that, or you can do the search engine. Um, you kind of got to go, there's multiple ways. You can run the report, or you can run the map. Um, this way, it's under ecological classification, or ecological classification. Um, it's just a really great map to show what's going on. And you'll notice with a lot of my plans, this is one of the first maps I start with because of how important forages are in a grazing operation. If I can draw those fence boundaries based off of those soils and isolate major groups into one specific paddock unit, the producer doesn't even know that he's winning at that point. You get these plans that just look like they work, it's because someone like you or myself or Josh, they spent a lot of time thinking about making these things work and becoming flexible, so that way we've got a long-term successful conservation plan. Want to jump to the next one? Fencing post depth. Seems like an obvious one, right? It is. Uh, I've started really including this one for probably different reasons than what you think. Everyone's thinking, well, fence posts, if you get rock, you can't really get a good fence post in there. If you get water, you can't really keep a fence post in there. That's absolutely true, and we need to consider that. But the bigger reason why I think people should be considering fence post depth is not so much how to, whether we can get it in there or keep it in there for our standards, which is very important, but the bigger issue is, is when we're giving a contractor or the producer that actual fence design and then we're taking that and it's getting submitted for bids by different fencing contractors. If we have situations where we're shallow to bedrock, we've got a lot of low super saturated soils that we're going to have issues with fence posts in there, the difference in cost from what that is bid at versus if they know that uh, there's going to be those limitations is significant. So that's a real thing to talk about up front and have people understand from the beginning with grazing. The fencing costs can have wide ranges in costs. And if we've got a site that has real restrictions, specifically with rock, that gets real expensive. I've already brought in uh, well drillers to drill in wells. We've made baskets of wire baskets and just piled stone in there. We've gotten the big concrete blocks for corners. I mean, you gotta get real creative and it gets real expensive. So that needs to be an upfront conversation 
less so from the conservation planning side and getting it done to meet our standards, but more so from the cost perspective for the producer. So that way we don't get them all the way through this planning process. They're committed to something and all of a sudden it's three times as expensive as what they expected. That's a real important consideration. Josh. Restrictive layer. All right. So what I was talking about before with grazing. April, well, let's say May through October, most grazing operations look really great. And if you uh, were to come back, you know, winter looks pretty awesome too. Maybe the the mid winter thaw is a little juicy sometimes, depending on if they're all outside or not. But typically, it's not a really big deal. Uh, but April and March and April in Wisconsin are mud months, and um, we've really got to consider that. And we got to consider what's growing and what's not growing. Are those plants actually uptaking nutrients, especially during that thaw period? And one thing that I want people to really consider with rotational grazing and rotational grazing plans and why this is such an important map to look at right away from the get-go is that depth of bedrock. If you've been paying attention to Kiwani, I know they've got a lot of issues down in the southwest as well, that shallow bedrock area and how fast water will move through those areas is very important. We don't want to design systems for outwintering or bale grazing or keeping cattle out there or even setting a sacrifice area right on top of an area that's very shallow to bedrock. We are going to create a resource concern if we're not considering that. So we need to be thinking about that upfront. And the other thing about that is, the reality is, is some sites just don't work for bell grazing. Some sites don't work for all winter. And some sites, you know, the whole site's just not great for winter. And it's really good to have that conversation with the producer up front. They know then right away that if you want to move forward with this plan, that you've got some real limitations and it's better to have those conversations in the beginning than at the end. It's going to save everyone a lot of work and it also lets you get a lot further down the planning process like Josh was talking about. Those are important things to talk about, especially if you want this to be successful for the long term. As with the other ones, I've included the web soil survey, kind of a little snippet of um, where you can go to get that so that we can find that. So if you print this out later, use it's a little bit of a guide to get to where you want to go. Josh? Flooding frequency class. So this is another one that I find very important. Uh, if you start working with grazing, everybody wants to graze everything. And that's not bad. But what that typically means is sometimes there's you're taking out those old pastures or you're including those old pastures that are along the streams or along corridors. And if they are going to flood, you really want to know about that. The big reason why you'd want to know about that is if you can avoid running fences across areas that are going to flood, that's a really big deal. One, you don't have uh, fences that are submerged. Two, you don't have that flow of water pushing across your fence, which a lot of times there'll be trees and branches and grass. And once that stuff hits those fences, it creates a sale and that can really impede or impact the lifeline or lifetime of that fence. So you've got to really consider that in the process from flooding, especially with moving current. Also, if you've got these flooding areas, it's really good to have that known and designed out for your pipeline because the same thing happens with the pipeline. You can get grasses wrapped around a pipeline and then once you've got water flowing through there, you've got a situation that creates a sale. And I've had pipelines that have been broken and split um, because of that. So a very simple solution for that is just a shallow barrier through those areas. It's protected. It's not going to get caught up by grasses. It's really just an easy, simple solution for that. So the best way to do that is to know this at a time. So if you've got this information, if you take the 10 minutes it takes to go to web total survey, do the area of interest and get all this stuff printed out, you've got some really great talking points right from the get-go for the landowner and you to discuss. And you can sit on the field and you can draw it out with a piece of paper, you can use a surface like I do, and that really speeds along the process and gets you really towards a good plan pointed in the right direction. The goal of all of this is to think about one, critical and sensitive areas. And then also remember that as far as NRCS goes, probably 50 to 70% percent of our contracts are gonna be small to mid-sized beef operations. A large portion of those are going to be keeping those animals out over the winter time. So you really gotta think about when is this gonna be the most challenging time of year? What's the most difficult situation to deal with? Like I said before, that's April and May, especially with the beef cows and the beef operations that don't have any concrete for those times. So you need to be thinking about this from the get-go. It's got to be part of the planning process right away, and that allows this plan to move forward. And you can really isolate and identify those sites from the get-go 
for the producer. And I've got at the end of this presentation, um, grazing plan maps, actual plan maps that I've done that show just how this comes about. And the really cool thing that I wanna to stress to everyone here, get good at mapping. If you spend time with producers in the field, you're gonna see really quick that you can give them all this paper, but if you give them one map, they're gonna stare at the map the whole time. So figure out how to do a good map that it has information on it that's useful because at that point it's a tool. And then if you take that map and you do it in ArcMap or some other mapping program where you can tie that to a geospatial reference, now you've got an, uh, a layout tool for fences, for water lines. You go out there with your phone, with your bad elf, whatever you want, and you can mark those out. It will save you time, it will save you steps, and it will keep things very accurate going forward in the future. Josh, next one. And then the other one that I wanted to point out really quick was going to be flooding. So, or excuse me, ponding. Um, and I was going to mention this with the flooding as well. So one of the big things with a lot of the grazing plans we're seeing is a wintering or at least developing sacrifice areas for the winter time. What you don't want to do is you don't want to put those in a wet spot. So understand the property, understand the nuances of that property. And if you're going to put a winter water out there, put it on high dry ground. This is a very quick way to show where that is. Another thing to consider with all of this, you know, if you're gonna be crossing animals through those areas, maybe really decide, well, I'll keep it on this side where I get at them in March and April so I don't have to go through this sw uh, swale and mud and make this muddy mess in the springtime. You can really consider or uh, manipulate the way that management's going to look and have a win situation for everybody. Those are the nuances that you need to think about when you're doing the conservation planning, when you're doing the grazing planning, that really make these plans kind of gel together for the producer so you've got a really nice overall project. I can't stress enough that understanding soils and topography will make everyone's world a lot better. I, it's from the first thing I look at, and I found it super important as we move forward with this planning process. Another thing too, if you're going to be planting a winter water, you know, don't put it in that low spot and you can identify those higher spots with this or a two foot contour map, get it up on the hill and don't be scared to put them further out there. I've already run 10,000 feet of buried pipeline to get it to a high dry spot for all winter. Now that's a lot. I don't think that everybody needs to do six feet of buried pipeline, 10,000 feet. That is probably, there's a big operation. But that being said, it's better to place those practices on the best site possible so that way we've got a long-term management plan. And the goal of these maps and the goals of looking at this and doing good planning from the get-go is long-term planning. Just because it's been managed this way for the last 50 years doesn't mean that's the way we're gonna go forward with this. We can really break this down. If a field's been a field for 50 years, but we've got two different soils in there or two different forage suitability groups there, maybe it makes sense to break it up. Just because it was that way doesn't mean we need to keep it that way. Break it up, manage it differently. Manage the one for the most production, manage the other one for the most production. Maybe this one, you'd only get three grazings off a season, and this other field to the right, because you split down the middle, you get five or six. I mean, you've just increased that producer's production. You've, you're going to increase soil organic matter. You're going to increase soil biodiversity, and I guarantee you're gonna get better infiltration. So by giving that producer better production, better dry matter production, you've actually just done a favor for the environment as well because I guarantee those sites are going to have better infiltration, better soil health, and it's a good win for the long term. Josh, next one, please. Okay, the other one I really want to stress to you, and this gets away from web soil survey, and I wasn't sure if we were going to talk about this today, but I find this really helpful, is the Wisconsin Manure Management Cistry Advisory System, Management Advisory System, excuse me. Um, I've got the website there. Follow that if you want to. It. I'll switch over to the next page, Josh. All right. This is a really complicated map. There's a lot going on there. I kind of cut different pictures out of it to show what's going on. There are specific county ordinances in this map. Um, there are all the different NP and K restrictions, the SWICMAs, the, uh, they've got the intermittent flow, the, you've got the lakes. Um, you got the permeable soils, you got the CAFO. Like, it can just be so busy that it's not even useful. But you can also go through those one at a time and evaluate those specific to the site. I really encourage you to do that, especially for sites that are gonna be potentially going to the CAFO level, 
uh, for grazing sites that have sensitive areas on them. Um, it's a good way to identify just sensitive areas in general. So either way you look at it, I wanted people to be aware that this is out here. I know Mike just did a training on this, but this is an absolute fantastic tool that paired with web soil survey and ArcMap can really paint a really great picture. And if you've got this as a bookmark and you've got web soil survey as a bookmark, you get good at this, you can pull all this information before you go to the field, 15 minutes, print out, and you're good to go, or not even print out, just take it on your phone. They can scroll through that or email to the producer, and they've got an electronic copy and we're not burning through paper. It's super useful and it shows a lot. Like everyone said before, you have to understand it's scale dependent. You can't just assume that because it says that, that's absolutely accurate, but it is a very good starting point, especially for fixed one. And I would encourage everyone for every grazing plan or any plan to look at this as well. Josh, would you flip to the next page? Okay, here's the DNR wetland map. So one thing that Josh was getting at before, and I really liked it because if you start going through NEPAs and going through the special concerns, like you can go into um, into the web soil survey or you can go into uh, the manure management advisory system maps, you can really get good printouts of those reports that make um, all those questions very quick and easy to answer. You can answer them with a high level of confidence. You don't have to print it out. You can save it as a digital copy. You can save it with that producer's report, or you can email to the producer for their own reference. And that's super useful for both you and the producer. Um, but either way, back to this wetland. I really like this because one of the major challenges with grazing is they want it. Everybody typically wants to graze everything. So while I'm absolutely in favor of grazing wetlands when appropriate and grazing long stream banks when appropriate, we need to understand that those are really critical and sensitive areas. You need to stay out of there when it's inappropriate. If it's wet, stay out of there. If it's muddy, stay out of there. If it's a hydric or a mucky soil, don't graze it. You know, that's just going to ask for mud all the time. But there are some of the sites that are, you know, on the edge that in the middle of July, you can go out to and graze and actually have a very positive impact on wildlife, on soil health, on the grass out there. So don't be scared of it, but understand the differences. And this is a very good way of recognizing where to start looking for those sites. Now, that being said, this also lays a groundwork. If those sites are going to need unique and special management, that's a great place to start drawing a line around, hey, I'm gonna put a fence around this. If you're gonna have to manage those sites differently, you need to think about can I put a fence there? Should I put a fence there? Is it polywire or is it permanent? Those are the places to start because that's what needs to be called out in your grazing plan. Those are the sites that are going to need to be excluded from all wintering in the winter time. So we've instantly shown on this particular property or whichever site you're looking at, what you need to pull out and where you need to start looking at first. Then you need to start making some decisions in the field as to how you're going to address that. All right, next one. All right, so grazing plan maps. The really fun part. So, like I said, you put all this stuff together, you take it all, shake it into a bag, and you dump it out and you put it into a map. My favorite way to map is still ArcMap. I like ArcMap. I like that I can take a shape file from desktop and put it in ArcMap. I can do all my fencing, all my forage biomass planting. I've got all of my inventories that we just looked at right there so I can assess them. I can draw them right on the lines that we've got. And then the really great part about that is I can copy those shape files, whether it's fence or water lines or, you know, forage and biomass plant. You just copy those back into desktop and you've got the exact shape file that matches your grazing plan as going to be in your conservation plan. For those of you who aren't in NRCS, it's still really nice because everything's going to match. The maps on web soil survey that you give to the producer or the ones that you would use for your grazing plan, everything's going to be the same acreage, same shape, same size. And, you know, is that really a big deal? Not so much if you're not super concerned about contracting and overlapping polygons, but for us in the NRC, NRCS world where those can cause some issues as far as keeping things going, or even the struggles that we deal with when drawing these out and the complexity that you see with grazing funds and desktop, there's a real benefit to maybe moving that over into ArcMap into more of an editing type program. So with that being said, I would consider or encourage everyone to consider how to get good at that. We want to talk about that and show you that. But these are grazing plan maps that were designed in ArcMap that the shape files can then be sent to desktop. And that's exactly what you're going to see. So, Josh, show me the next one. 
All right, two foot contours. This is one of the first plans or first things that I like to do that I don't easily get from web soil survey or from uh, from any place else. I mean, you can you can find it in different spots, but I've really found ArcMap to be the good, the best place to go for that. I know desktop has the two foot contours, so and you can do this as well. But what you want to do is you want to come out, especially for grazing, you want to identify all the concentrated flow paths. That would be something I would tell you to do before you even go to the field the first time. Then then go out there and quantify whether those are actually potentially a resource concern or not. I guarantee that if you've got a concentrated flow path and the producer wants to own her, you should document that out there because that's going to be a sensitive area that you don't want to put bales on in the wintertime because you're going to get mud. Or, or worst case scenario, you put the bale out there in the wintertime and they graze through that right through the bottom of that V, right? What do you got in the spring? You've got a flush system. So all the nutrients and all the hay and everything that was there, it washes down the creek. Where you could have placed that on either side of that, you could have kept the nutrients there and probably avoided the muddy mess and receding that in the, the next spring or fall whenever you'd want to come back and work it up. So two foot contour maps are very important. Documenting concentrated flow channels are very important and understanding where water's flowing because what we're looking at with grazing is soil health, water quality, and soil erosion. Those are the big ones that we're looking at right off the top. And knowing where water is going is going to be the easiest way to start addressing all those issues. Please advance it. All right. The other one, as I showed you before, floodplain, a floodplain map. You can see with this particular one, look at how I've adjusted the fences so that they're outside the floodplain. This is an actual grazing plan that's done, developed, and built. And you can see how I was able to use the Tupa contour map the flood map and I put that into a very simple layout. It took all the busyness out of all those other maps. I combined it into one and I showed why we've got fences here. You can clearly see why I put some of those fences, especially in the northern end of that field, into those different groups. Josh, do you want to point at the northern end there, please? A lot of people would wonder, why are you running those at an angle? Like if you didn't see that floodplain map or understand the soils there, why would you run that at an angle? In this particular case, we did that because there was a ridge there. We had three different soil types there, and we were able to come on there and that this particular gentleman can graze that site probably two or three more times a season versus the wetter sites on either side of it. So that's why we wound up with that. Also, we've got that corridor, which you'd be surprised about, but when you look at the contours and the floodplain map, look at how far to the south that actually runs, that kind of dog leg down. There you go. Oh, the other way into there, yeah that floods back there. You wouldn't expect that, or you wouldn't expect it to be as wide as it was. But once you start looking at the contours and soils, you can clearly click that, pick that out, and you can see why fences were placed where they were. This is going to make the fence life better. It's breaking it out so you can manage the forages better, and you're gonna be able to get more use out of this site because we've thought about that long-term. This is high probability of being out there 20, 30, 40 years from now and we've made it easy for the producer to manage. So the other thing with this particular site is you see a lot of interior fences there. Those are spaced, I believe, at 300 feet apart. I believe it's, I think they're 300 feet apart. And uh, that spacing was designed so that way he could pre-place bales. It was not so much for the width of the summertime grazing, but it was specifically designed for winter grazing because I knew based off of our conversations and taking a look at the maps that we've looked at before, that this is part of his plan. And part of his plan for that is he can have a base or run of uh, bales for outwintering. So we've designed this plan for a summertime management, but we focused on the difficult times of the year, winter, March, and April. We've got a water way out there. We've got a water 600 feet away from the, the buildings. You can't see it there, but there's a little barn right there now. And we've got them on the side away from the water. So switch to the next one, Josh. So this is what I was saying before. I've got those concentrated flows documented. I've got all the critical areas documented, the floodplains, the wetlands, um, any soils that have hydric. I've taken a look at the SWICMA maps and I've restricted any wetland areas. Uh, this did not have any shallow to bedrock. If it would have, I would have cut those out. And what I've done is I've taken a look at those I buffered them based off the 590 standard, and the areas left are going to be good areas for grazing, 
for outwintering for sacrifice areas. But more importantly, what I've got here is a map that's condensed all of those other maps that we've looked at into one simple map that this producer can use as a tool. This is a very easy tool that we spent time to condense and make 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 sense to the producer. It's an easy glance so he knows where to go and not to go. And I think that's the point with all this. Get good at mapping, make the map tell a story, but more importantly, understand how to interpret those soils like we've been talking about so that way you can get really good at this because that's when things get really fun because that's when your plans start to work good. You get these producers that are just great to work with, but even more importantly, you can sidestep those potential pitfalls. And that's something that I want to stress. By understanding soils, you can sidestep so many potential problems and you can discuss that with the producer and it all just comes together and gels nice. And that's the fun part of the job. Remember, this is the best part. We get to work with people, we get to be outside, we get to come back and drive by that and see it work. So that's fun. If you don't like that, you're in the wrong job. Josh, please move forward. And then finally, a restriction map or bale grazing map. You can see with this how I've isolated the concentrated flow paths. I've taken out the sensitive areas and I'm off all the steep ground. And it's a very clear picture for where he can go in March and April. Well, actually October through April where he's gotta be. And this is a clear map. These four pictures or these four maps are very useful for a producer. You combine that with a grazing plan and a narrative and you've got something that you can really build off of and you can design your fences off of that, your pipeline off of that, your winter watering facilities off of that. You've got a nice system. And that's the thing that's probably the most complicated with grazing is you've got so many different moving parts. You've got to consider it all before you even get started. You're never going to get it right all the time, but you really want to try to follow yourself towards a successful one. And then finally, we got one more, I believe. This was the forge balance. Now you can do multiples for this, but if you go all the way back to the first one there, we had the forge suitability groups. If you go into section two of the Wisconsin Photog, you can print out the different forge suitability groups per county. You have ranges for um, planning. All right, you never want to use the high end, especially from the beginning. Use middle to low, depending on what the producer's management is, and then you're going to get a number. And this is something I want to stress to people. Remember, these are very much book values. They're good estimates. They're a good start, and they're probably going to be accurate five to eight years out of every 10. That means five to two years out of every 10, you're going to get either more or less production than what we're talking about. So I want to stress to everybody, this is a good starting point. If you're planning these grazing plans to the high end of the forage suitability group and maxing out the acres, if you look at the bottom there, Josh, you want to circle around there, you got 93.4 acres is what it says we need. What happens when we max the acres out and we make those meet exactly, especially with beef cow operation or cow calf operation, we plan this for 100 acres and we've got say 80 cows that says we're perfect, right? Well, those cows eat and you get the summer flush or the spring flush and you cut that off and then you have calves and the calves are drinking on the cow and they're milking and the cows are milking but what happens during the summer slump right you get a situation where now the calves are eating and uh the cows are eating the cows are still milking but you've lost production and you don't want to put yourself into a situation that you have to bring stored feed out there if you can help it. It's better to set these systems up so that way you can mechanically harvest them. You can go out there and graze and you've got the flexibility. People think that mechanically harvesting and grazing are two different things. It's the same thing. You're harvesting forage, it's just how you're doing it. One's much cheaper. So you gotta figure out how to make these systems work. And what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna use the more expensive system when you can use a cheap one. And that's a very important thing, especially for beef economics in, in Wisconsin. And we can use these maps, these soils, and we can develop these plans to make that work. So the last point I wanna put on that, use the forage suitability groups with the forage balance. Understand what's going on with it. Understand what the numbers mean and don't plan to the maps. You know, the best thing is to have 20% more acres than what you need because that allows you to graze the entire summer. But then if you take that 20% and you set the farm up so that way you can come out there and mechanically harvest this part in spring and this part in August, it's a win-win. The producer hasn't lost any hay ground, but more importantly, they've grazed through the entire summer, even as the herd's growing and gaining. Next one. So questions. One thing though, like I said, 
these are just a good starting point. These are the first ones I look at. But if you got any questions on that, I'd be more than willing to go into that or dive deeper into any of the specifics as to what I'm looking for. All these.